Welcome to the People Teaching People podcast. Joining me on the podcast is Meg Wilcox. I met Meg at a promotional video shoot for an upcoming and exciting podcasting event coming to Calgary this fall, 2024, called Pod Summit YYC. Her interview was just before mine, so I got to listen in on her conversation with Jeff Humphreys of Shortline Creative and host of the Calgary Sessions podcast. As I listened, my curiosity to learn more about Meg was piqued, and I'm thrilled for this opportunity to have this conversation with her. Meg Wilcox loves a great story. Her earliest audio memories are from when she was only four or five years old, listening to CBC radio in her dad's art studio. While he painted big sweeping landscapes, she would divide her page into frames to make her own comic strip-like stories. One frame just wasn't enough. In hindsight, it probably isn't too surprising that Meg ended up a journalist. She spent many years traveling the country as a radio host, producer, and reporter with the CBC, CKUA, and the BAMP Center. Now she teaches audio storytelling, podcasting, and media freelance in the journalism and digital media program at Mount Royal University in Calgary. She is also co-director of the Community Podcast Initiative, a place to encourage and explore storytelling and community connection while amplifying and supporting voices that are underrepresented and misrepresented in traditional media. Meg is an award-winning podcaster, and in 2020, she was one of Avenue Magazine's Top 40 Under 40. Her first book is called The New Journalist's Guide to Freelancing, and it's out now via Broadview Press. Thank you so much for joining me today, Meg. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So one of the things that I found so interesting as I've been starting to get to know you and looking into some of the things that you are doing and have been doing is that you grew up listening to CBC Radio. And this was something that I experienced as well. And maybe at the time, I didn't appreciate it as much as I should have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and now I listen to CBC as an adult. But I just remember long drives in the car, especially with my family. And they would have that CBC Radio playing as we headed out on our holidays. So I'm curious what led you as a four or five-year-old listening to CBC Radio in your dad's art studio to decide to become a journalist and what did that journey look like for you? Yeah, it was... <sighs> It was a bit of hopping around, to be honest. I think I always knew I liked stories, whether it's, you know, listening in my dad's art studio and hearing that on the radio or, you know, my dad, he's retired now, but was a, a high school teacher and an artist. And so what I always loved going to the galleries with him is I always had someone to give me a tour and tell me the stories of the art. So, you know, looking at the paintings maybe wasn't exciting for me as a kid, but learning through story was something that I found I identified with quite a bit. And it was as I was graduating high school and going, I was on th in Thailand for a year-long rotary exchange, that you really realize how much story connects everyone. And I had a journal. I was journaling hardcore every day, starting it with, you know, quotes and song lyrics because you're 18 years old and that's what you do. But realizing that I, I loved to write and I loved to tell stories. And sometimes I would write essays about the, the experience of, you know, living away in Thailand and sharing them with my other exchange student friends and their response to it. And I realized, oh, I really like an audience for my writing. And so when I came back to Canada and knew I was going to university, I, I looked at some different programs. And to be honest, I, I applied for journalism and was accepted, but turned it down because it seemed a little too intimidating. The idea of committing to a job was was difficult for me for my studies. I was like, I don't know if I want to be a journalist. And so I told myself, well, I'll just do communications. And like, you can learn to be a journalist through communications, more or less. And I ended up working with a, a nonprofit doing story-based work after my undergrad, but that's when I decided afterwards that it was time to apply for journalism school for a master's program when I was finally a little bit older, had some experience and was like, no, I actually want to take this idea of story and, and see it through in a certain way. And I came into the program hearing from many people 
that radio was often the unexpected favorite. But for me, I already kind of had an imagining that if I was going to work in anything, it was probably going to be radio. I'd spent years doing public speaking and presenting and debate and all those things. And the idea of telling story through talking was just so appealing to me that when I, I hit that first radio class, I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Well, I love how it was really a journey of self-discovery in, in sort of coming to realize that this was the path for you and this is what you wanted to do. And it wasn't just that straight line. Because I think sometimes people look at people who have found success and, and passion for a particular field and think they must have just known exactly what they wanted to do when they were little. And then they did everything that they needed to do in the right order to get to that certain place in their, in their career. And it sounds like, you know, when you look back, hindsight's twenty twenty. you can see all those puzzle pieces sort of coming together, but it really wasn't a perfectly straight trajectory. I'm curious to, did you ever have one of those Fisher Price tape recorders when you were little that you could record yourself on? I, I'm i not sure if I did. I'm trying to think. I remember having one of the little record players, right? That like yeah, would play the yeah. sounds and stuff like that. But I don't know. My parents were probably smart enough to not give me a recorder. I talked a lot as it was. I, I started doing, when I mentioned public speaking, like I think I started in third grade or something like that. I, I started quite early. <laughs> That's amazing because that takes some confidence, right? And kind of overcoming sometimes that nervous energy about getting up in front of people and talking in front of others and speaking in front of others. Our youngest is at STEM Innovation Academy. And interestingly, one of the options, it's a mandatory option. So I guess you can't really call it an, an option per se, but they do. It's called STEM Talks. So they actually have to do public speaking. And I think it's such a great skill to, to have because we're not all wired that way. Yeah. And what I love so much about it is it, it took me a while, I guess, until I got to university that I realized that if you could do debate or you could do a presentation, that was basically learning how to write an essay. So it, it actually gives you those other skills in your writing and your communications. If you can verbalize it, then you can probably, you know, use that in how you organize and plan how you present information as well. Hmm. Yeah, all those overlaps and connections. So, okay, you decide to go down this path and you're going to be a journalist and you really love the medium of radio. So within that world, you've had some different roles. So as a radio host and a producer and a reporter. So what would be some of your key learning experiences and highlights from those different roles that you had in the field? Yeah, I think the first one, and I think this is more journalism as a whole, is just the importance of expertise and facts and context when working with anything, when you're learning about anything, when you're researching a story or trying to make sense of something. And I feel that's so important now when we are starting to face a bit more misinformation, disinformation these days. People are trying to make sense of what they're seeing in the media or online. And while I know that sometimes we look at more traditional outlets and I'll say that journalism can rely a bit too much on the experts who are academics, maybe not people with lived experience. I think that's starting to change. I think expertise can be a variety of things, but I think that importance of listening to people who are experts in their field is, is so important. And so I think of how much I learn daily when I am practicing journalism because you get to speak to so many smart people who they're the story. They know the information. I, I just get to learn about it as, you know, one of the, the fun elements of the job. In working in radio, I think, you know, a lot of the work is interviewing. And that's where you really realize that collaboration and people are at the heart of, I think, anything that really matters and that live is best when you can. There's, there's nothing that beats a live conversation. And whether you're listening in your car and just know it's live or live recorded, but without as much, you know, editing or, or mixing in, that's really what creates the most, I think, compelling audio. Mm -hmm. There's some magic to that, right? And being able to listen into that, that real-time conversation. My kids are I won't use the word tortured, but they <laughs> on the daily, they're listening to CBC in the morning as, you know, I'm getting ready for my day. And, and there is just something so compelling about not only hearing about the news, but it's like those real time conversations with people in the community or experts in their fields about 
things going on in the world and their perspectives and thoughts around them. It is really quite powerful. And one of the things that I'm assuming without knowing you super well, but you seem to have a real curiosity, like you want to get to know people. And how would being curious sort of factor into your roles uh, in radio? I think it's everything. I think, you know, and I think it just learning in general, right? I think most journalists have to be curious because if you don't want to get out of your comfort zone and learn about something new every day, then it's a horrible job for you. But I think without that curiosity and wanting to look at things from other people's points of view, you sure as heck can't translate that to an audience, right? If the interviewer isn't having a good time, then why would the audience have a good time? But I also think everything there's just so much more to it when you get to speak to an expert about something you don't know. You know, I think of one piece I did for Spark years ago where I was interviewing experts who were basically working on trying to create almost a, basically a 3d version of Google maps for people. And it involved, you know, me, they were talking to me about how eyes work and how we, they all work a little differently. And so what that means in designing 3d worlds. And I, I just remember like having my brain blown a little bit thinking, I don't fully understand what's going. I kept having to step back and ask more simplistic questions. And, and it actually got back to like, yeah, the nature of how eyes are different and perceive things differently. And you think about, wow, this is something that someone gets to work on day in, day out and understand all these intricacies, right? And, and so, yeah, I think without curiosity, like first off, there's not much of a drive to do it. And I think I see that in, in my students in the classroom too. It's the students that are curious and wanting to encourage them to pursue that curiosity Otherwise, they're probably not going to do as, as good of a job. They won't spend as much time on it. And if they don't feel invested in a way, yeah, the, the output will not be as good. And that's actually one of the first things we, we talk about is, you know, first, first year of class, first day of first year of class, we often put on the board, you know, be curious, be brave, ask questions and make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, recognizing that questions are hard to ask. I think in society, we're taught there are certain times where we can or we can't ask questions. There are certain questions that are seen as polite uh, or impolite. And so part of it is really in encouraging them to go with it and that, you know, really there's no such thing as a wrong question if you ask it respectfully and you know that there may or may not be an answer that comes to it, but really pushing them out of, out of that comfort zone and by following their curiosity to be a bit brave and to ask those questions. And, you know, if they end up making mistakes, that's okay. School's a great place to make mistakes. So, you know, some of the students take it more, more wholeheartedly from the get-go, but it's something that we, we always try to push a bit in each class. Well, and it's, Wonderful that you create that safe space to ask questions and to make mistakes because there's a lot of fear that goes with learning something new, a lot of nervousness. You don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to make a mistake, but there is so much learning that comes. Well, I think more learning comes from mistakes than from our successes. If we're truly curious to understand what we did wrong and how we can do better next time. But I love sure. that you're creating that safe space in your classroom to do just that because then it allows people to be curious and not be nervous or afraid to take those risks or chances and, and to step outside of their comfort zone and do things that might feel a little uncomfortable or a lot uncomfortable. <laughs> Well, and it's tough because you can work as hard as you want to try to create that space or think that you are. But I, I sense a lot of resistance from my students. That fear of being wrong is is strong. And I feel that maybe is even stronger over the past, I want to say, you know, three or four years than I recall when I started teaching. And, and that is something that, you know, we're still trying to figure out and address and that's yeah, what what exactly is a failure? What does that even mean? Is is getting a question wrong a failure? Some students might say yes, right? And so trying to figure out how we negotiate a space where where it is okay. And and part of that's about talking about my failures. Man, they hear about probably more of my failures than they need to to try to, you know, understand that taking those risks are okay. Yeah. We're all human. We all make mistakes. And yeah, it's great as an instructor as well. You're you're showing that even you <laughs> who are teaching the class are human and make mistakes too. Now, so your role, you are an associate professor at Mount Royal University here in Calgary, and you're teaching a number of things. And, and one of the things that I found quite interesting is that you're you created a podcasting course that you have been teaching since 2017. So 
why a course that has to do with podcasting? Like, what is that all about? And what are your students' responses to, to being part of a course like that? Yeah. So the, yeah, the course started in 2017 and I was asked to develop it. So there was just interest from the faculty in general that they thought, oh, like if we think, you know, Serial came out in 2014. So podcasting started to blow up and get a lot more attention then. So this was a few years after that. And, and they knew that I, I podcasted. I did that work with that. Well, the BAMP Center is where I started to focus more on like podcasting only content. And I was like, sure, I can develop a class. And you know, for me, from a, a teaching perspective, what's great about podcasting is it still teaches you radio skills and audio skills. All the stuff you need to know to podcast, you need to, you could do for radio. And we have to admit that podcasting sounds a little sexier than a radio class. So, you know, thinking about where the students are at and what they're interested in, it seems like a, a good way to sort of mix the resources we had at the school and, and tr you know, provide that training. But that first year, the, the course at the time was called Audiovisual Projects. So most of the students signed up for it thinking it was going to be a video class. And I think only two stu students, when I asked them to put up their hands, listened to podcasts. I think both of them cited Joe Rogan as one of their favorites. And I was sort of like, okay, like, let's see how this goes. But by the end of the semester, I'd say most of them were on board. Not all. A few of them were still unhappy. They didn't get to do video. But it, it was really neat to see them explore and enjoy the medium because they didn't know too much about it. And that's changed quite a bit now. You know, I, I think even two or three years later, I remember walking into the first day of class and seeing a student wearing a Radiotopia t-shirt, right? So, you know, a radio network, or a podcast network. So the idea there was that, you know, students are starting to listen more and engage more with it. And now it's a, a required course. So I, I get students that are keen and not keen, but we've changed it in a way that we also make this uh, community service learning. So every semester, the students, we, we partner them with an organization and produce a series together for them. And I think even if the students aren't interested in podcasting per se, they love the ability relatively early in their program to actually work on something that they feel matters, right? That you know, it's actually going to get, if all goes well, it's going to get published. They get to meet with the client, hear about what they want to do. And then we work together. How do we do this in a journalistic way, but, you know, serving a community organization. And so it's a chance for them to, to produce something, not just for themselves or for a grade or that they hope they can publish later. But, you know, this semester or this past semester, my students and I worked with the, the Calgary Surge. We're going to be putting out a series about basketball and community in the city and sort of how the team came to be. And for them, that was so neat to, you know, get to meet the people who started the team and who run these things and to go out in the community and interview people around that. So it's been an, an interesting change over the years to see how the course has grown. Hmm. And so interesting to connect the skills and knowledge with a really authentic experience that makes a difference for other people, but also that great learning experience for your students too. Because I think that's when students get invested, right? When they're doing something and it feels real and it, and it doesn't really beg the, the question, like, why? Why are we learning this? Why are we doing this? <laughs> They're doing something real and impactful and, and interacting and engaging with the community in a really interesting way. Ooh, are you taking any students who might be in their 40s and are just looking <laughs> to <laughs> take a class for fun? Oh, I keep learning about all these new programs and I think, oh, like I wish something like that had existed back in the day when... I was looking at options for school. There seems to be so much more out there these days. Yeah. And, and the one thing we're really excited about with our program, at least with journalism and digital media, is that we've created a minor now at MRU in digital storytelling. So that means that students that maybe don't take broadcast or don't take journalism, they can do a minor with us. And the podcasting class is one of the courses they can take. So you could do a minor in media production, get some of that experience while still doing your you know biology degree or your business degree or something else. And so I'm really curious to see how over the next few years it might shape the makeup of the class too, that we don't just have people coming from a journalistic perspective, but what that might mean to have students from, from other backgrounds as well. Well, and to have that mix of backgrounds in that type of class, I think some incredible magic can definitely happen in that type of environment, right? And, and I love too how you pointed out you get a mix because it's a mandatory course of students who want to be there and students who might not want to be there. But yeah. it, it's I bet it's interesting to kind of see where they're at with things too at the end of the course. Maybe they love it more than they thought. 
they would when they started, right? And it and it gives them that skill set and that really valuable, authentic experience as well. Now, along with all the roles that you play, and I'm sure what must be a really busy teaching schedule at Mount Royal, teaching is one of those all-consuming professions. I, I know from personal experience. Yeah. So you're, you're juggling a lot of things. Along with that, you're working on your PhD and with the University of Glasgow. So I'm curious, how did you connect with the University of Glasgow? And then also, I'd love to learn more about what your PhD is all about. So I know it's a podcast practice-based thesis. And yeah, I'd love to know what you're planning to do with that too. Yeah. So, I mean, the PhD and deciding to pursue that came more or less from my faculty role. So what's interesting, you know, with journalism is that a master's is a terminal degree. So by having my master's, I, I could teach and, and I got tenure with my master's. But I knew in wanting to develop, you know, as a prof and as a researcher to have the opportunity to do that PhD work and to have some guidance, right, to learn how that works a bit more in the academic space, I you know, when I got into teaching, I realized journalism is essentially research, but it's never been framed like that as, as a practitioner, right? And so for me, learning the language, whether it's applying for grants or developing that stuff, or even just figuring out how that work can look a bit different, I wanted to be able to have some support with that. And so the one thing with, you know, studying at a PhD level, which I, I'm sure you're familiar with, is you can look to schools, but you ultimately need a supervisor who's willing to work with you. And so my challenge is I was trying to look to schools that would have people who could supervise me. And the, the truth is there are not many people out there who can. <laughs> and or maybe you'd find a, a, a prof who would be a great option and you realize they don't offer a PhD program or the school didn't do remote learning or something like that because I knew I would be doing at least part of it, uh, a good chunk of it part time while I'm also teaching. And I ended up stumbling out a, a professor, Mark Banks, who doesn't do podcasting at all. That is not his area of expertise. But what he works in is, I guess we could say cultural economy and working in the media. He does a lot of research around what is the, the value of cultural work. And so almost putting numbers and value and explaining to these bigger concepts that are often hard, hard to, you know, provide proof around. And a lot of his work has been around diversity in the media, too. And so he was doing some really neat research at, at another university. That's sort of where I saw I saw his info. When I reached out to him, he was about to take a job at Glasgow and said, you know, I'd be interested in supervising you if, if you're OK at Glasgow instead of this other place. And I thought, oh, twist my arm, you know, going to be so hard to spend some time in Glasgow at some point. But it, it's been really interesting for me that, you know, what I really wanted to research and it's still being developed, but I came to my PhD with the idea of wanting to work on collaborative methods of journalism and audio storytelling. So journalism as a field generally isn't very collaborative. And the old school practitioners will tell you that it's because we don't want bias, right? That if you collaborate too much with your subjects or your, your, your sources, then you're basically going to be working PR instead of journalism. And, and it seems to ignore, from my personal opinion, that you know we need to be able to be accurate as well. And if we're from the outside of a story and we don't collaborate with our sources and we bring our outside perspectives, we are more likely to be inaccurate. And that's what we see with most groups who are either underrepresented or misrepresented in the media. It, and so what I'm wanting to look at is what are ways that we can collaborate that adds richness and context to these important stories but can still maintain rigor, can maintain ethics, can, you know, you know, come at it with, you know, a respectable way of doing this. And I think there are already lots of practitioners who are starting to find those ways of doing it. And so that's what my supervisor, Dr. Mark Banks, was interested in. The idea that he could support me on the academic and research side, but was very clear from the beginning saying, Meg, if you need someone who can help you make a podcast, I, I can't help you with that. And I thought, oh, I've been doing podcasts for a while. I feel very confident on that side, but I need someone who can support me on the research and basically let me do what kind of sounds like a zany project. And so it's been really neat. He's taken the opportunity to learn more about practice-based work because he doesn't do as much of that either, but he's been very supportive and taken on other students doing it. And uh, I actually just found out he's taken on another other or PhD student or position in doing uh, like podcasting as a practice-based thesis. So it seems like it's going to be growing. 
Oh, that's amazing that it is a field that's growing, that your supervisor is also interested in and curious about learning more about what you do and, and this space. And then it sounds like a great match, right? He's really able to support you in the areas that you're needing that support. And, and then he can kind of let you do your thing in those areas that you have all that strength and and experience. Now, you mentioned to me that you're going to be collaborating with Inside Out Theater. So I know you don't know exactly what it's all going to look like, but tell me a little bit about the general direction and with Inside Out Theater and how that will connect with the work that you're doing. Yeah. So Inside Out Theater is based in Calgary and it's made up entirely or serving with and working with artists with uh, different disabilities. And uh, it's a chance for, you know, these professional actors and and experts, you know, in their own fields to create stories from their own perspectives and and produce artwork and and work within the community. And Ashley King is the artistic associate at the company and she's been working on a play that is about her experience of how how she went blind when she was in her her late teens yeah or in mid teens and 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 what that experience was like for her and so we're going to be getting together with Ashley and the team that's working on this play that she's been working on and workshopping over over more than a year at this point and we're going to co-create an audio project and maybe that's a podcast series. Maybe it's more documentary style. Maybe it's creative. Maybe we work on creating an audio version of the play. I have no idea yet because part of this is that we get to work together with the team and assess what are the strengths? What are the interests? How do we want to do this? So, you know, on one hand, I'm coming in a bit as a researcher, but also as a facilitator. So the first part of this thesis will be for me working with this group to create this audio series that we we decide to do together. But then also as a researcher, I'll be interviewing everyone throughout the process, like what's working, what isn't working, what are some of the choices that we choose to do. And so we're actually going to come out with two audio, I guess we could say outputs, we'll have the series or whatever we decide as a group. And then I will also be producing my own audio piece more say like a, a documentary to seeing the outcome, but maybe learning as well a little bit about that process of discovery too, along the way. How did you end up connecting with Inside Out Theatre? Uh, through, I think, just recommendations and, and a bit in town. Cole Checky, who's the artistic director of the company, we have mutual friends, but he also does a lot of work in kind of like documentary theater. He, he One of his more recent projects was where he interviewed people who worked in, was it High River, I want to say? No, Brooks, in, in the meatpacking factories and, and about uh, temporary foreign workers there. And he turned it into a play. And, and so getting to see that and, you know, for me, it's such an interesting way to connect. It, it was journalism work, but it's also theater and thinking, oh, this could be a really interesting point of connection. And Ashley, who I mentioned is the artistic associate, she's actually a graduate of the MRU journalism program. I didn't teach her. She graduated around the time I started teaching there. So I feel like there's this interesting connection of you know artistic creation and theater, but also an understanding of journalistic practice and other ways that it has been engaged with. So we kind of come at it from different points, but all have some similarities as well. Hmm. So a lot of interesting worlds colliding <laughs> Yeah. to make this all come to be. Now, I know that the outcome of your work may or may not be a podcast specifically, but I'm curious as far as podcasting goes in thinking about it as a teaching and learning tool, how do you kind of see that being used in your current context of uh, teaching and maybe your experience at MRU or what you've heard about? And what do you think is possible with it in the future? Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways it's possible. I'll talk a bit about uh, some of the ways that I use it. One of the things that I started immediately when I started the podcasting class is I created these assignments that I would call assigned listenings. So normally in a class, you'd get assigned readings, maybe weekly, maybe not. And my thought was, I thought back to English classes that I took in undergrad that are kind of those survey courses where they recognize that the people coming in maybe don't know what like those key documents or, or books or sources would be. So I thought, 
if someone comes in with no experience in podcasting and we want to talk about story-based podcasts, what do they need to listen to to understand the field a bit better? And tends too few, but it's a way to start. So I would assign these listenings and they'd get some guided questions. And every class we would start with a 15-minute discussion about what they listened to. And what surprised the heck out of me was submission rates were very high, even though it was like 2% a week, like you didn't necessarily need to do all of them. Most students submitted, I'd say eight or more, no, no question. So higher than what you'd normally expect for say uptake of a reading. And anecdotally, they were telling me it was their favorite part of class, which I found really weird. Cause like, why would the homework be the favorite part when we get to produce a podcast together? Like why, why would the readings be the favorite? So I started doing a bit more digging into that. I'm doing a, a scholarship of teaching and learning research project to understand a bit more like, okay, they tell me this, but is it true? And so I've been collecting submission data, like just how how many students are actually submitting the work over, over the years, some survey data. So asking them a bit how they feel about it, how they engage with the, the podcast, and then also doing some focus groups to get a bit more detail sort of on podcasts and how they're engaging with it and what it means for them. And so what's been really interesting is that the vast majority of the students do really like the podcast listenings. They say they're more likely to complete them than if it was a, a reading. And and they also say that part of the reason they, they that happens, I think, or they engage with it is because they can do other things. Like I, I tell them, you know, if you're driving or if you need to go do groceries or something, you can listen at the same time. Like I'm not going to make you sit and just look at your computer or your phone while you do it. And, and partially because that's how audiences work, right? So why would I expect you to be different than a regular podcast listener if you're going to critique a piece. And, and then the other side of it that I found kind of interesting too is that this has been coming up more up through the focus groups, but it seems like it's a particularly good way for helping support students who are neurodivergent. Being able to have different options for how they engage with their, their homework and their assignments has, has been like really resonated. But the other thing that I find really interesting with it is that I guess, you know, we assume that students always want to do less reading. So we, we, one of the questions I ask is, you know, would you rather see more podcasts uh, than readings or, or just more than what we see now? And actually, while 60% said they'd like to see more, almost 40% said that they actually like the mix that they have now, that they still want readings for certain types of information and there's stuff they know that needs to be reading, but if there's alternatives or ways they can do the same thing, then they'd like to know what those are. And so I think this is showing just how savvy our students are in, in understanding media and that there's advantages to different types and there's different situations for it in their education. And so, you know, I think there's so many ways that podcasting can be implemented. I think listenings are fantastic if you can. What I hear from other profs is they say, well, I can't find a podcast that has what I want them to read. And, and I think that my, at first my response would have been, maybe you need to look a little harder or make your own, but actually like, well, talking more with students now, I've realized if all you're doing is trying to replace a reading, then you shouldn't be putting a podcast in anyways. One of the things that the students say resonate with them in terms of listening to podcasts is to hear personal stories in the voices of those who have lived it. And they, they actually recently talked about empathy, how it helps them develop and understand that and to provide other contextual clues as, you know, they're young and making sense of the world and, and connecting with people and figuring out where they, they lie in it. And so now I'm starting to think more about, we always talk about these soft skills that we want to help teach students or help them engage with difficult topics. Podcasting seems like the ideal way to bring some of those elements into the curriculum. And I think more importantly, especially as homework assignments, right, to give students a chance to maybe process difficult topics. So, for example, in my class, we have listenings about residential schools, like we have a Connie Walker series, most recently the Surviving St. Michael's episodes to listen to. And, well, you know, there's a bit of a, a discussion at the beginning to open up and, and that as they go and do their homework and, and listen and they have guiding questions and we have a discussion after, you know, we could listen to that in real time in class, but that's not going to give them time to process and work with what they need. And so I find that, yeah, podcasting is opening up this opportunity to have difficult discussions, to share first person and lived experience, and to talk about it in terms that don't always come through when we read or, or when we're working with textbooks. And, you know, the students were suggesting even when we did our focus group, you know, 
even something like nursing. At first they were like, could you use a podcast? And they thought, wait, part of nursing is learning to work with clients. Wouldn't it be great to listen to podcasts where maybe you hear a first person client or, or patient perspectives about what it meant to go through this system that, you know, that's, that's never going to replicate what was in a textbook, but, you know, maybe that's something, another way of approaching that, that content. Hmm. I think you're getting some really rich, interesting feedback from your students. They're super smart. Yeah. They're always like smarter than they, they always surprise the heck out of me in a good way. Yeah, it's so true, isn't it? And when we take the time and have that intention behind really like wanting to understand how this way of learning is influencing them, what they think, what they think is possible, where they think it would be a good fit, how it's making a difference from for them. There's such rich, like great feedback that you can get. And I I love how you were talking about too, like for kiddos and students that learn differently, they are really connecting to podcasts as a way to to learn and gain information. And having that diversity in terms of how students are accessing that information, really understanding like where reading comes in, where listening to a podcast comes in. And and also too, it's not about choosing a podcast, as you said, just for the sake of choosing a podcast. Perhaps that reading is better. We don't need to necessarily find a podcast to replace every reading and, and having that mix um, can be really valuable. Ooh, I really and like that. <laughs> Yeah. And the other thing that I found really interesting too is, you know, one of the students was mentioning that when they're given an article, they, they scan immediately. They have the questions and they just hop through for what they need. And that's more or less how you've been taught to say read an academic article. But they said that the real time nature of podcasting and the experiential element of it meant that they approached the, the homework totally differently. In fact, one of the students said they didn't even look at the questions I was asking ahead of time because they knew they had to listen to it anyways. Why not just enjoy the experience and then go back to the questions after? Uh, some of the other people in the focus group were like, oh, that is not what I do at all, which is also fair. But I found that so interesting that when you know you have to do something and you know that it, it, you have to just sit and experience it and there aren't really any shortcuts. I mean, you can speed it up a bit, but otherwise there's much there. It, it changes how maybe how you approach it. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, I like how that student took the approach of I'm just going to listen to it through and look at the questions after like I, yeah, again, you know, taking that time to really get to know your students and be curious about how they're learning, how they're approaching um, their learning gives you great information as an instructor as you continue to kind of tweak and adjust what you're teaching them and how you're teaching them. I, I could talk about this all day. <laughs> so I wanted to, though, ask you as well about now a big part of your work is you've been working with a team of undergraduate podcast producers and co-led with another practitioner around working respectfully with Indigenous knowledge and expertise and research in podcasting. And I read that this is included looking at some best practices for developing land acknowledgements for podcasts. And this is something that really piqued my curiosity as someone who's like wanting to listen and learn more and understand more about Indigenous ways of knowing and reconciliation. So what does this work look like and what have you and your team been learning through this work? Yeah, we, we've actually just wrapped up a four and a half year grant, but it's going to ex extend in other ways later. Basically, it started with uh, a, a grant to produce the Canadian Mountain podcast. And so this podcast is out of the Canadian Mountain Network, which won one of those big Nash networks of centers of excellence, federal funding grants, and basically to fund mountain research around Canada. And not just looking at it from a scientific perspective, but what early on what became a focus for the organization was bringing in indigenous knowledge and expertise, especially in understanding mountain systems, right? And ecosystems, cultural systems. And so, so we were hired basically to start this podcast that would interview the researchers and experts that were working on, on these different funded projects. And uh, it started with in including indigenous voices and then pivoted to centering indigenous voices. And that, to be honest, when, when that changed, I thought this is so interesting, I should probably not be holding this grant. <laughs> but what I, I decided to do instead is bring in Kyle Napier, who is a fantastic audio producer and researcher himself and with an indigenous background. He's currently up at the University of Alberta doing his PhD in indigenous policy and education. So he's worked with me to sort of redevelop the program with our undergraduate students, because MRU is all undergrad. So we have students as audio producers 
and we would make the series together. But in order to make the series and, and start thinking a bit about, you know, these researchers and, and working with Indigenous expertise, it really forced us to stop and think, well, okay, how, how are we going to approach this? How might this be different than if we were just interviewing profs all the time about their, their research grants? And before Kyle joined the team, we did start the discussion around land acknowledgement. And I think part of it was just more, it was something we were familiar with, right? If you'd gone to an event or you'd heard of a land acknowledgement, it was an opportunity to at least start to connect. And generally speaking, podcasts don't have land acknowledgements. And there's several reasons for that. I think part of it is where is here in a podcast? We both happen to be, you know, in Mokinsis in, in Treaty 7 territory, but our listeners could be anywhere. The servers where the files are can be somewhere else too. And then there's also the element of, you know, how often when they're framed and rather long, pod, pod, I was going to say podcasts like to keep things shorter. Land acknowledgements can be quite long and a bit clunky and people might tune out or, or might not engage with it the same way. So those were things we were considering in trying to learn about land acknowledgements, find some in podcasts if we could, but also in speaking to to, you know, mentors and, and other Indigenous people and, and, and groups within the university to figure out how could we apply this to audio. And that was a really interesting experience. What, what it actually came down to, Professor Patty Derbyshire at MRU had recommended to us, she does a lot of work in reconciliation. And she, she said, well, what does this land mean to you? And, and it was so interesting to see how the students responded. And for context, this conversation started in fall 2020, when we were all online and, and working remotely, the, the entire team. And for many of us who were, it felt almost caught in our homes, we, we, we were sort of in and out of lockdown at that point. Many of us had turned to the outdoors, right? Going to the mountains, going to parks, going to those areas. And it became a point of connection for our team that even though we were looking at each other through screens, we could talk about maybe our weekends in the mountains or how we were going outside regularly and, and what it meant to be in an area you know, that is so beautiful and so wonderful and provides us with, with so much in, in this region particularly. And so that sort of informed how we approached the land acknowledgement. But one of the biggest parts about it, and, and Kyle was instrumental in doing this as, as he joined the team, is that we committed to revising and changing the land acknowledgement every year. So the idea was that we could as we learned more about language or framing or, or content or how we wanted to play the role we wanted to play in this space, we could adjust. And every year we did, we would have a discussion around the words that we used, the terminology, we made shifts and we made adjustments. And that showed us every year sort of how we were learning and growing and adapting, but it also forced us to start asking questions in our process of actually making the podcast. So for example, in journalistic practice, you normally wouldn't give questions to someone ahead of time. The assumption would be that they might over-prepare it, which so it might not sound good, but also if it's, for example, an accountability interview, you don't want to be giving, say, a politician the questions ahead of time so they can prepare whatever they want to say, right? But in acknowledging that, you know, first off, these aren't accountability interviews, these are informational interviews. So we want the best answers that we, we can get. But also knowing that many of the people we interview, particularly if, say, their background is Indigenous, the, the years of, of experience of potential, their own experience with media of being misrepresented or, or not included or unfamiliar with certain practices meant that building relationship was one of the most important parts of the practice. So we decided... That's it. We're going to share our questions ahead of time. We're going to provide that feedback or uh, be open to that feedback and to talk about it. And another way that we we changed our practice is we allow all of our, our guests to vet, to listen to the episode before it goes to air. And they have about a week to listen and give us any feedback if they want to. And and often this, the, they choose not to. That's that's great. Or we like to think that means we've, we've gone through a good process and they feel good about the final outcome. But often when there have been requests for, for changes, it's because we've been inaccurate either in our language and scripting or perhaps an edit that has taken something out of context that we might not know. And so it's been a fantastic learning opportunity and, and to improve the final outcome. And, you know, part of all of this overall with the students has also been an opportunity for different training sessions to learn about Indigenous uh, history in Canada and, and present elements too, right? Uh, often we, we think, oh, Indigenous history, it's from a while ago. But no, what are the realities now? For many of our students learning about the realities for Indigenous knowledge 
and and we could say other expertise in universities and how until very very recently it, it you know many of these institutions were built to to keep indigenous knowledge out or in many cases researchers going into communities taking indigenous knowledge and then publishing it in journals and you know libraries and places where these communities couldn't even access this information and so you know it's a chance for them to learn how we move forward in these cases, but to understand the histories of maybe, you know, the institutions in which they're, yes, they're getting an education, absolutely, but that we can still critique and improve these, these institutions as well. So it's been neat. We've done some on the land learning, some like hiking trips with experts and hearing stories and recording, meeting with elders. And also, you know, sometimes just going, like we went to a play last year, an indigenous play that was in town and had lunch and then got to go and, and watch art and enjoy it. So a question that I really wanted to ask you about was about the community podcast initiative at Mount Royal University. And I'd love to learn more about what exactly this initiative is all about and how it came to be. So the idea of the CPI was to create opportunities for our students in our program to go out and tell stories with the community, not just in the community. And, you know, podcasting is such a great way to play with different formats and not necessarily have to always be the expert journalist doing the interviews. Maybe it's doing facilitated conversations or panels. And so thinking about other ways that we can produce and tell stories and and look to solutions journalism and all those other types of things. So we sort of had it as a concept and we're able to build it through funding to create our studio space. We didn't have a podcasting studio space at the time. And so that opened about a year and a half ago, November, 2022. And so now we have a physical space that the students can use and other creators in in the area that we, we partner with. But the idea is that we can produce interesting audio stories in and around Calgary with people that maybe aren't being covered in traditional media or being misrepresented if they are. And this has taken on a whole bunch of different types of projects, or it's included a whole bunch of different projects. So the Canadian Mountain Podcast is an example of some of the CPI programming. We've also done projects like the class projects I mentioned. So for example, the podcast class, the one with the surge in the past, we've worked with MRU Counseling, the Women's Economic Council, um, the Sustainability Forum in town. So all sorts of different series that come out through that. And uh, we've also started playing with uh, podcasters and residents. So we had our first last year, Karina Zapata, and she produced a series called The Second Gen. So the the experience of being a second generation Canadian in not just in Calgary, she interviews people from around the country, but mostly based in Alberta about the these shared experiences, regardless of your background, but maybe being shared by that that common connector and mostly younger people too, perspectives. So the idea is that we'll hopefully be able to bring in funding to, you know, create these opportunities for our students and young journalists to develop journalists who might come in as podcasters and residents and also to have community come and, you know, learn and work and tell their stories through the podcast initiative and and hopefully, you know, being able to take these skills back into the community as well. So it really seems like a space and a place to build community and that it's all about community and using podcasting as a way to kind of facilitate that sense of community within Mount Royal, but also beyond creating some really meaningful connections. Now, I know there was a significant grant that you received that supported this work, and you are also recognized in part with this amazing work that you've done in being a Calgary top 40 under 40 as well. So congratulations. That's an incredible way to be recognized for doing this important work and and really creating such a beautiful sense of community with podcasting. So I wanted to ask you as well, and I know that you shared that your book is not directly connected with podcasting per se, but, you know, been a big part in creating this community podcast initiative. You're doing your PhD, you're teaching students and creating courses and writing a book. So you've written a book called The New Journalist Guide to Freelancing, Building Your Career in the New Media Landscape. So I'd love to learn what your book is all about who's it for and what really motivated you to to write it. Yeah, the book was honestly, it it sounds dramatic to say, but I want to say 10 years in the making or more. And that's because when I graduated from journalism school, I did an internship and then basically was thrown into 
freelance work. And I knew it's more or less what I wanted to do as I figured out where I wanted to go, but I didn't have any guidance or help in figuring out what to do. At that time, not as many people were doing freelance. I mean, it, it was definitely growing. I, I graduated in 2010, so people were doing it. Most of my professors and mentors, if they did do freelancing, they did it after having a more traditional media job. So developing, you know, their portfolio and a name for themselves and, and getting training before going into the freelancing side. And I just remember that first year where I was trying to read these different freelancing books, but they were mostly American. And so not all of it applies to us. And uh, well, it did talk about the money side. It didn't really talk about the other stuff that you might need to consider, you know, when you're starting out. And so I kept thinking, oh, a book on this would be really great. And then I spent a good eight to 10 years working as a freelancer and did not have time to even consider writing a book because when you're freelancing, you're, you're just hustling full time. But when I became a faculty member, I started thinking about well, is there a way I could actually, you know, maybe find a publisher and make this happen? And most of it was written over COVID working remotely. And it was really a chance for me to sort of hunker down and think about how to put, put it together. And I lucked out in some ways because many of the journalists that I profile or I interviewed for the book were at home. So they had a bit of time to meet with me remotely and, and share their stories. But in writing the book, I, I basically wanted to create something that's not too long and it's under 200 pages, so it's not too long, that really looks at the perspective of someone who's starting out, whether they're a student or a recent grad or maybe new to the industry. What are all the things you need to consider when you're starting your own business, but also considering it from the perspective of a media maker? Because most people, I'd say in media, go into the work because they're passionate about it. And I think this is hopefully starting to change, but I feel like many schools, and at least when I was going through journalism school, they, if you asked a bit about money or getting paid, they were like, oh, don't worry about that. Like, we're going to focus on the craft and, and the rest will get figured out for you. And, you know, that leads to embarrassing things like my first publication, I didn't know I needed to invoice to get paid. I'd signed a contract. I assumed they'd just pay me. And then, you know, that wonderful city editor helping me out on a weekend on how to do an invoice. And so... It's, it's one of those things where I, I really try to take what I've learned from working with students too, those questions that they have that I might not have expected when I started out and sort of trying to approach it holistically. And so really, it's a starting point, the book. I, I sort of say, you know, like, these are all the things you should probably be considering or thinking of. These are some of the questions you should be asking. And some of this is going to apply to you. Some of it isn't. And at some point, if you really get into freelancing, you're going to level up and this book will not be as helpful for you anymore. But it's to sort of open that conversation and think about it. And one of the ways that I've gotten to use the book, which wasn't anticipated when I started writing it, is that I've been able to redesign our program's media entrepreneurship course, which is now required for our journalism students and broadcast students. And so uh, I've gotten to teach the book as a text and actually do a lot of the activities with the students through class. And so it covers everything from, you know, pitching a story and how you develop your network work and find your contacts. But we also do a lot of personal finance, you know, starting with personal budgets to then understand how budgets might look for your business or running as a sole proprietorship, which is, you know, how anyone's going to start out in this industry. And this last week, actually, students, we were filing our taxes. So learning how that all comes together. And yeah, it's been really neat to practice these skills and, and well, you know, it was a little scary, like, oh, man, is the book maybe not going to work? Did it did it all work in my brain? And then I put it in front of students and they'll tell you if it doesn't work. Right. But it's been really cool to see as they learn these more practical skills to support the creative skills and the other things they've been developing in their degree. They're coming out of the class confident for when they graduate. And that's been been really awesome to see. Wow. Like how amazing to have created this book and then to be able to put it into action and work with students and then to really see the impact that your book is having on them as they're learning and growing and then, you know, heading out into the, into the work world. And I love that it, you know, really grew out of you looking for something that wasn't there for you. It's, you know, oftentimes, you know, we get motivated to create those things that we just wish we would have had, right? If we had known when we started those questions to ask or the fact that you needed to send that invoice in order to get paid and, and all those little details, which, you know, in retrospect, you might think, oh, I should have known that, but we don't know what we don't know. So to have that, that guidance is so key. And I love that there's a course on that because that is so 
needed to really set people up up for success. So congratulations again oh, on uh, <laughs> on really making a difference for your students. Now, I always talk about how education plays such an important and integral role in everything that we do. And I know as an instructor, as an associate professor, it's a huge part of what you do. But I'm just curious as to what final thoughts or words of wisdom you'd share to with people listening that would maybe inspire or help them on their own teaching and learning journeys. One of the, one of the things I often hear uh, when people find out what I teach and what I do is they say, oh, I wish I'd gone to school for that. Or could I, maybe I should go back and take a degree in this. And my first response, and, and I'm sure MR, you wouldn't love this from a recruitment standpoint, is do you need to? That, that there's so many ways we can learn and we gain our skills that you don't need a degree in something to be able to do it. And I think particularly podcasting is a great example. Yes, there's lots of resources you can learn on your own, but journalism and storytelling, when we teach it, it's teaching you ways to approach it. But part of how you do that is having life experience and expertise in other, other things other than just telling stories, right? And so, you know, people sometimes say, oh, I need it. I should have taken a course in this and maybe a course would help you. But what we go goes back to that idea of curiosity that you said right off the top, right? That if you're curious and you're engaged and you can ask smart questions, you can learn a lot of this stuff on the fly. And that's in many ways going to be more useful, I think, than learning it in a classroom environment. And, you know, for many of my students, they talk about when they graduate, when that rubber sort of hits the road for them, that's when they realize the skills they have, but that's also when they expand them because they're they're given that, you know, tougher situation where they need to learn to adapt and take what they've they've done and, and make it even better. So, you know, I think, learn, as you said, learning's everywhere. And yes, there is a time for credentials, but I think now as we're moving into whether it's micro-credentials or those other types of ways of learning, that's where I think, that's where I think the, the interesting stuff is to come. Yeah. Just maintaining that curiosity and you never know where you're going to learn something. And yes, so much to be learned from actually the doing it and, and getting that actual experience for sure. Well, Meg, I want to thank you so very much for sharing your time and your stories and all your words of wisdom with us today. So if people are listening and are curious about learning more about you and all the things that you're up to, where are the best places to find you and find out more? Yeah. So first off, the Community Podcast Initiative. So that's thepodcaststudio.ca. And you can find on social, on Insta and Twitter, at community pod yyc and i have a website occasionally updated megwilcox.com i'm on instagram and twitter as well at meg hw amazing i'll make sure to share all that in the show notes and meg i want to just thank you so much for joining me today it was great to connect with you and to learn from you oh thank you so much this has been such a wonderful conversation thank you